Today on Talking Solutions, exciting new topic. We're going to discuss genetic health care and to fill us in. Dr. Rob Raleigh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Also in with us, Anna Victorine, board certified genetic counselor with Providence Healthcare. <laughs> yes, pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming in. This is a new topic for us. What is genetic healthcare? Well, I suppose genetic healthcare would be managing individuals based on their genetic information. So synonyms may be something like personalized or precision medicine. At Providence Healthcare, we do genetic evaluations, which is in the form of genetic counseling and, if needed, genetic testing. Thinking about when they did the whole genetic code, they broke down DNA and they said, we know a lot more information now. Right. So since that time, there's just been a tremendous amount of information available. I didn't know if this was connected to that. It was the Genome Project. Wasn't that what they called it? Yeah, right. There's two parts of that. I mean, we've always had the genetic information, and then there was just an agreement really trying to understand disease at its most basic fundamental premise of where it came from. And they decided to actually sequence the human genome. And there's two groups that actually did it. One was government and one was private to kind of understand what the basic core of what made us have health and disease. Genetic health care. Anna, you mentioned really, truly personalized health care mm-hmm. because it gets to the point now where you know so much about this person, whatever it is that makes them special and unique, that it truly is health care for this one person. Right. And that's where we hope it will be one day. You know, we're still scratching the surface of what all of our genetics mean. Just because we can look at someone's DNA doesn't mean we can determine everything about them. But genetic testing in certain instances, for instance, cancer predispositions can be really powerful to making sure that someone and gets the best health care and the best screenings. And that would not only make a difference to the patient, but I would imagine when it comes to cancer predisposition or a tendency toward having cancer occur, it would not only be for the patient, but in a lot of times for their family. Right. And that's something that's really important with the genetic counseling process. A lot of patients, when they go through genetic testing, they think that they're just coming in for the test. And they don't really understand that this is one of the few medical tests out there that can tell them a lot of information that could help their family, too. So that's something that we go through together. We talk about how it can impact other family members, which other family members could be most impacted, and how to share that information with their family. Genetic testing is something that generally affects more than just the person sitting in front of you. So genetic health care is not necessarily just for that one person, but it can really be instrumental in helping the family as a whole. Right. It tends to snowball through the family. Once we identify a condition in one person, then the patients tend to tell all of their family members, and we see multiple family members from the same family coming in then to learn more once we've identified one person. Because it catches on. They go, mm-hmm. this is a really good idea. Yeah. How long has genetic health care been around? Is it relatively new? Oh, it's been around. Even in the 90s, they were doing it, but they were looking less at the risk and more of kind of what we call the dysmorphology. So as we think about, you Down syndrome. We've known about Down syndrome for decades. And now what we've kind of moved into is what we call risk management as opposed to disease management, meaning that if you understand the basic risk of someone's disease, then you can be more proactive before they have disease. That's kind of the change that's happened with genetics really in the last 20 years. We've focused more on what is their risk of having the gene, and that was mostly because of the cost of testing. And then we really started shifting over with the test going in lower and lower is this person has a condition, find that one individual that's affected with the disease, and then go back and ask the question, was genetics their risk for that disease? And as a result of that, that family member knows kind of what that risk is, so we can test the other family members and say, this is where your risk came from. The positive side of that, too, is if the person that's affected has disease and the genetics, then we can actually test the other family members, and if they're negative, they can kind of take that worry maybe out of their concerns because they don't have the genetics that predispose their family member to it. Makes me think of Angelina Jolie, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. she had lost her mother to Mm -hmm breast cancer, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it also was occurring elsewhere in her family. Mm -hmm. And they must have tested her for that. Was it the BRCA? Yes. So Angelina Jolie's mother, I believe it was a BRCA1 mutation that she carries. I believe she was diagnosed with cancer. So I assume that it was identified first in her mother. And then her mother told Angelina and Angelina made the decision to test before she developed disease to see if she was at risk for the disease, which as it turned out, she was. And she took those proactive steps. She did. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the other side of that too is let's say she was negative for the test and her mom was positive, the influence that would have had on her, kind of taking away that anxiety. So that's the good and the bad. The challenge that she has is once she has that result, we do know that people go through the same process and that's where Anna does a phenomenal job at kind of counseling them of being diagnosed with a disease. There's a group called Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered, which is FORCE. They call themselves providers because they've never had disease, but they get diagnosed with something before they have it, but they go through the same grieving process as if being diagnosed with a disease. I could 
understand that. Yeah. If you're expecting that my genetics say it's quite possible that I'm going to develop this disease or this mm-hmm. medical condition, you would be, well, I guess you'd be watching for it, certainly. Mm-hmm. But as you said, going through the same grieving process, because mm-hmm. chances are really good that I'm going to end up with this. Yeah. Speaking of Angelina Jolie, I mean, the one thing that we really try to enforce, too, with people is she is a positive for the genetics, but some people actually get the breast cancer and they don't understand the concept of where that risk came from. And they take the same steps that she took, even though they don't have that genetics. So we have to make sure the patient understands both sides of that, why she made those decisions. Yeah, because that's a pretty severe step to say, I'm going to have a double mastectomy to keep myself from going through that cancer. Mm -hmm. And other people go, I should do that too. Mm -hmm. How about you don't do that until the medical testing tells you that you are a very good candidate for getting that type of cancer? Mm -hmm. That's where the genetic counseling comes into play, right, Ed? (laughs) It sure does. We're talking about genetic health care, and we've got Dr. Rob Rowley and Anna Victorine. You are a board-certified genetic counselor. Yes, ma'am. Anna, how does this happen? Do we come into an office, have some medical tests, you take a look at them, and then set us down and talk to us about it? In a nutshell, yes, but in reality, it's much more complicated than that. Traditionally, what happens is the patient will be referred by their physician, male or female, to our office. We go through their medical history, which includes reviewing their medical records, if they've been diagnosed with cancer, are they at risk for cancer, there have been an abnormal biopsy. We then look at their family history, usually four generations, to look for any cancers or any other health conditions within the family. Using that, we provide them with a risk assessment for their chance that they could carry a genetic predisposition to the condition like cancer. We then do a little genetics 101, what DNA is, what is a mutation. We talk about the benefits and the limitations of the testing. Sometimes patients have options of one test versus another test, depending on their concerns and what they're trying to find out. At the end of the day, then, we go through whether or not they really want to do the testing. Believe it or not, some people don't want that information, and that's completely okay. This is really scary information for some people. For others, it's really empowering. So we delve deeper into that and make sure that they feel comfortable with whatever decision it is that they're making. We usually can draw the test the same day, and then when the results are back, we interpret the results for them and teach them about the condition if they're positive. Anna, what type of cancers can be detected through genetic testing? So we can't detect a cancer, but we can detect a risk factor for cancer. The most common cancers, so the ones that everyone's familiar with, the ones where we're strongest with genetic testing, breast cancer, colon cancer, ovarian cancer. But there are genetic risk factors out there for many different cancers, so we can potentially learn quite a bit about someone's risk of cancer through genetic testing. And by doing genetic testing for that patient, it helps, I would imagine, with their survival rate when they do encounter a medical condition? Absolutely, especially if that person does not yet have cancer, because then we can say, okay, well, you have X percent chance of developing that cancer. Here are steps that we can take to decrease that risk. Sometimes there are drugs that someone can take to decrease the risk of cancer. Sometimes they can start screening at earlier ages. Goal with screening is not to prevent cancer, but the goal is to catch it in an early stage. I'm sure you can imagine that a stage zero cancer is a much better prognosis than a stage four cancer. Absolutely. So the goal is to, at least if it's there, find it really early. Okay. With cancer, the thing that I hear again and again is that if you catch it in the early stages, it makes all the difference. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, stage is very, very important. There's some exceptions to that, but as a general rule, that is definitely true. So if a patient knew that they have a high probability, let's say, in developing a breast cancer, first of all, you're going to really, really watch for that. Mm -hmm. So every visit and the patient, they're going to know there's a chance I need to keep an eye out for this. I need to be on top of this Mm -hmm. because we're talking about breast cancer in this Mm -hmm. instance. Very, very manageable if you catch it early. Mm -hmm. So the medical practitioner, if you're the doctor, for instance, Dr. Rob Rowley, if your patient has a high chance of having a breast cancer, you know to watch for it. Mm -hmm. Tests can be done for it. The patient also is looking for it. It's like everybody's on the same page. Right. And well, you can direct focus. And that's really the kind of the concept of precision medicine. You're taking that individual and really focusing your attention on the areas of risk that you know a lot better than a general kind of worried about every condition. And that's really what the genetics provides for us is that risk. The term we always use, we want someone to walk out of an appointment with us empowered as opposed to condemned. That's a very important thing that we push with people is you're really empowering your family to be proactive and know what that risk is as opposed to blindly going and suspecting you're at risk. I believe personally information is power. But as you're saying too, Anna Victorine, board certified genetic counselor, some people just 
just don't even really want to know. I guess all of us live our lives differently. Right. And some people just want to live for today and deal with it when it comes along. But I don't want the advance word. Right. For some people, it's really scary. It can affect their quality of life. For other people, they do want the information, but now is not the right time. I'm sure you can imagine maybe an 18-year-old who's just starting college may not really want to know right now that she has an increased risk of breast cancer. Or maybe someone's about to get married and maybe they don't want to deal with that right now. Sometimes it's just timing. And we talk about that too. I understand you want this information. Do you want it right now? And some patients say, you know what? I actually don't want this right now. So that's a piece of it too. Yeah, You both bring up a good point. Usually we reserve testing for if there's a decision that's supposed to be made or an action that's supposed to be made as a result of the testing. And so as you know, talking about different ages, some of the conditions we really tell, you really should wait to at least 18 to 21 to do the testing to find out because there's nothing that's going to change in your health care management until those ages. Where other conditions actually show up in the pediatric population, so we want to get it tested early. And Anna, you were saying a lot of the patients who come your way mm-hmm. are referred by their doctors. So yes. Dr. Rob Rowley, would that be a situation, for instance, if you have a patient who you think might benefit through this genetic health care, you might say, let's take this road and see what we can find out for you, which will be beneficial. Well, that's a great thing as Anna and I are working together. The wonderful thing is we really put it in two parts. There's the risk assessment and then there's the management. So really working together, we can both understand that person's risk. But not only that, we can really start working on a plan for that individual. And that's where we're moving is to understand what their plan is because we feel that someone's empowered if they have a plan. They walk out of the office saying, oh, I'm at high risk and there's nothing given to them about what to do about it. That's really where we run into those challenges with the patients and making sure that they understand the patient is empowered with that information. We're talking about genetic health care today on Talking Solutions. I know that we've been discussing so far a lot about cancers because this can be very useful in that area. And we were talking specifically about breast cancers, things that affect women. But this can also have a big impact on male health as well. Absolutely. A lot of my male patients especially, I think they're a little more apprehensive when they're referred for a genetic evaluation regarding breast cancer because we all know that the risk of male breast cancer is relatively low in the general population. And always what I emphasize is that this has implications not only for your own health, but what if you have daughters one day or what if you already have daughters? What if you have sisters or nieces? What about your mother? So sometimes it can impact their female relatives, but it can, of course, also impact them. We know that there are predispositions to female breast cancer that can also increase the risk of male breast cancer if a male carries them. BRCA1 and BRCA2, for instance, are two genes that it can increase the risk of male breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, and prostate cancer, and those can affect men. I know that men are not a big percentage of the breast cancer cases, Mm -hmm. but I have a friend who has been a stage three breast cancer survivor Mm -hmm. as a man. Mm -hmm. So it does happen. It does. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about it happening, even though rarely to men, once again, it's that family link that we were Mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our long-term goal, too, is that we start migrating towards prevention strategies or early detection and treatment. I think we're really seeing that with Alzheimer's disease and talking about other conditions, is we know that with Alzheimer's, it's probably going to be a condition that we catch early, just like the cancers, to prevent it from progressing or even developing. And so the Gen X really offers that opportunity to start doing that. So that's another condition that this genetic health care can also help us watch for, things like Alzheimer's? Yes, the, the genetics of it has not worked out as well as the cancer, but definitely there's some stuff. People talk about the APOE gene of being a genetic condition, and we don't use it necessarily for risk, but it does definitely help prognosticate, meaning that it helps us determine what the trajectory of that illness is going to be based on their genotype. Well, as our population <laughs> ages, I find the longer you live, the bigger the chances are that you're going to encounter some big health thing. That just makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. As our population ages, Mm -hmm. we talk about the looming big numbers when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, Mm -hmm. the amount of people who will be affected by that, people who later in their life may deal with cancers. So as we go along the road with our health care, at some point this would make sense to look into genetic health care? Absolutely. If you want to be futuristic about healthcare, us as humans, I'm an astronomer by interest (laughs) only, but people are talking about going to Mars by 2030. I was reading over the weekend. And one of my first articles I published was looking at genetics of those individuals that are going to be going on that trip. Because one of the things, hemochromatosis, which is an iron overload condition, is if they go in space, they break up more red cells and they would actually start manifesting the disease and their trip. And as you know, there's not a lot of hospitals in Mars. but, But the challenge with space travel and those interests is 
because we can understand their risk for disease. So when they go on the trip, you're not managing illness on that trip. The possibilities are endless. That idea that we can start preventing some of these illnesses and people can live to 95 without the illness is really kind of a goal, a long-term goal, of course, but that's something that genetics could promise. And it's not just living that long, but it's living that long with a quality of life. Right. Right. Genetic health care is our topic today. We've got Dr. Rob Rowley in-house also, Anna Victorine, board-certified genetic counselor with Providence Healthcare. When we're in a doctor's office and we're filling out the forms, which I don't care what kind of computer age we're in, we're still filling out a lot of forms. There's a lot of questions about family history when it comes to conditions like cancer. And so it would be important for us to know what our family has dealt with. I mean, because when I go in and I fill out the paperwork and they say, has anybody in your family dealt with prostate cancer? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't really talked to my brothers and my dad and my uncles about that. Would it be important for you as a patient to find out what your family risk factors are so when you go to the doctor and you fill out those forms, you are well educated to know, yeah, we do have a history with that. So everybody involved can be watching for it. That's one of the things we do push. And that's why we push not genetic testing. We do genetic evaluations. That's a very important point because that's exactly what we're asking for. Family history is still the best genetic test. So yes, absolutely. Finding a good quality family history and understanding what's going on in your family is very, very important. I just don't think we talk about it a lot over the Thanksgiving table where we go, hey, have you guys had any problems <laughs> with your prostate? You know, it doesn't come up in every conversation. Right. So it might be a good thing just to talk about so that everybody at that table knows what their risk factors are. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of times when a patient finds out that they're going to be seeing a genetic counselor for genetic evaluation, that's when these conversations really start. I have a lot of patients who tell me they're not really sure of any family history of anything and in the few weeks it takes before I see them. In the meantime, they've said, I told my mom I was going to go see a genetic counselor and just made sure there was nothing. And she gave me this list of all these mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. and That's what I'm saying. Exactly. All of a sudden, it tends to kind of prompt people to do a little bit of digging. Mm -hmm. That said, though, we do have people who are adopted or don't know one side of their family or are estranged or whatever it may be. And we still have tools to help get them information. Really? Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. So genetic testing is helpful in the context of a family history, but we certainly understand that not everyone has access. So in those circumstances, sometimes there are genetic testing options that can actually get them more information about their family. So there's always some tool that we can use if needed. How long have you been a genetic counselor? For about two and a half years. How did you end up in this area? <laughs> <laughs> I'm originally from the Midwest, born and raised in Chicago, and I just really hate snow. So that is why I'm over on this side of the country. Uh, yeah, I'm very honest. <laughs> I'm from Kansas. I hear you. I, Everybody who I meet from the Midwest, they say the same thing. I just really like warm weather. But part of the reason why I stay in Las Vegas is because this community doesn't have a lot of genetics professionals. So I know that I'm really making a big difference here. We've heard over the years that our medical options are limited. I think they were years ago, but I don't see that so much now. We do have a lot of options available right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The opening of the medical school at UNLV yes. mm -hmm. and all the stuff attached to it. I find this to be a very exciting time as far as medicine in Southern Nevada. Absolutely. If a patient knows through genetic health care what they're dealing with and there is a prescribed medication, do you ever know in advance that it may or may not work? It might not be the best option? Well, there's two prongs to that. There's actually testing the, someone's disease like a cancer. There's a lot of interest in checking the genetics of that cancer and then based on that determining therapy. And then the other part of it is actually testing someone in terms of how they metabolize a drug and from that deciding what treatment there is. And there's absolutely medication that are altered based on someone's genetic. Probably the largest example is clopidogrel, which is called Plavix. We do know there's a genetic susceptibility that someone that after a heart attack is put on that medication and gets no benefit based on their genetics. The challenge with all of this is you're starting to get into volume of information. And how do you get that volume of information at that point of decision to make a clinical decision for a patient? But there's all kinds of genetics that are used to actually determine treatments. I believe information is power. I've always felt that way. Yes. Yeah. Even 
even though we may come across a patient every now and then who says, no, I don't really want to know. Everybody has their own life to live and their own way of doing it. Genetic health care, do you see this as something that one of these days soon all patients will have as part of their treatment and therapy? Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's any question about that. I think where we're at is probably the DOS of computers. <laughs> um, we're just really trying to figure out what are the algorithms to put together to understand. I always say we're working as a clinic on what are the stethoscopes of tomorrow. That's kind of one of the things we think about. And one of those big pieces is information technology. How do you take that information? How do you process it? How do you present it to both the clinician and the patient so that they can make actionable decisions? And what role does that have in overall health care? Genetic health care, it's right here. It's available to us. And is it a big expense on top of everything else that we do? Because it sounds like a lot of this genetic testing and genetic counseling, such a positive part of your health care, it's a smart thing to do. Is it going to become so common that just like when we go to the doctor and they go, you need to have a real quick blood test or you need to have a real quick Mm -hmm. urine test. It's going to be, we need to do a real quick genetic test on Mm -hmm. you. Well, you know, the thing that is interesting is how our minds progress because I've been in a Las Vegas since 2005 and seeing the progression in the community and really the general population of America go, starting to want that prevention side of health care. Genetic kind of weaves into that. In the past, we said everyone over the age of 50 have a colonoscopy. I think it, we'd all think it'd be great if someday we could say, you know what, based on your genetics, this is your screening program. That hopefully will cut cost in terms of unnecessary screening too. So answering your question, yes, I think genetics will play that role, but how do we implement it? Well, and you notice with all of our health care plans, they say when it comes to preventative medicine. This approach of preventing something mm-hmm. bigger off in the distance mm-hmm. is such a smart way of working with our health care. Yeah. You know, that's a challenge because insurance is to insure the risk. And if you know the risk, then how do you insure that? That's a great question that needs to be asked and answered. And how do you get people incentivized to actually take that prevention? You know, understanding that they're going to have to spend money to develop that prevention plan and to get their health care taken care of. Genetic health care and the testing and the counseling, is it the sort of thing to any person who's listening to our discussion today, would you say, if you're curious about this, ask your doctor? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a lot of patients that come in that don't have a strong family history of any conditions. They just heard about Angelina Jolie, for instance, or their grandfather had Alzheimer's and they just wanted to learn a little bit more. And I think that in a lot of ways, those are the patients that are helped the most because Mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of guidance. There isn't a lot that they can Google and learn about it. So those are the ones that can really, really benefit from having a genetic evaluation. Sometimes we can uncover information information that really drastically changes their risk. Mm -hmm. Other times there's still genetic testing options available to them to help get some reassurance or get them more information or to get ready to plan their families. Mm -hmm. So there's always something that we can think of to help get them information they're looking for. Genetic health care, it's here, it's smart medicine. And so you would think Dr. Rob Rowley and Anna Victorine, both of you think that if people are curious, go ahead and ask your doctor, say, I really would like to check into this, just a smart thing to do. Right, absolutely. absolutely. There's no harm in asking your doctor. Yeah. It can make a big difference. That's the first step, yeah. Mm-hmm. The information that you could get through genetic testing, I would find that really empowering. Mm-hmm. And when you get that good news that you're really not a big risk for breast cancer or for prostate cancer or or whatever, that would be a tremendous relief. A lot of my patients feel the same way. I have a lot of patients who go into testing saying, I know that I'm positive. My mom's positive. I know I have this. I've grown up knowing I have this and they test negative. It is an amazing experience to be a part of, to see that weight just be lifted off of their shoulders and know that their risk is no higher than any other person's risk. Not a bad thing to check into. Is there anything that I'm forgetting today that you would like to get across? I think we'd like to make sure the excitement that it's tempered with reality. There's a lot of interest in this because of the potential that's there, but we're kind of being in the infancy and I don't think we should oversell it. And what we see, I mean, is making sure that they understand what that means. And it's not a simple 12-minute conversation. We spend an hour with a patient, which is very, very important. It's all about balance. We have so many new approaches to medicine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff with people online all the time and television ads, kits that you can send off to get your mm-hmm. DNA all evaluated and all the information that you on your own as a patient mm-hmm. can say, I just want to know. I'm going to send this off. I don't care how much it costs. I want to know this stuff. Is there a downside? Is that a good thing to do? Every patient has the right to their genetic information, right? That's what makes them them. But every patient has the right to obtain it in a responsible way where they have the context. If a patient 
parent goes online and finds a company, and there are companies out there that will do cancer genetic testing, but don't look at your family history at all. They may not have had the right test. So they may get a result back from the company and say, hey, I'm negative, I'm good to go. And little did they know they didn't have the right test ordered. And if they'd had a genetic evaluation, we may have recommended a different test or a larger test or a different company. So there are many different situations where someone can have the best intentions of trying to help but can accidentally hurt themselves with misinformation. Mm -hmm. But it was on Facebook. (laughs) I think there's two terms that are real helpful is familial versus hereditary. And so Anna, one of the things she's pointing to is if they could have a very strong family history, but we can't find the genetics to it, we're going to still put them in the category of familial risk of cancer, even though the genetics hasn't shown us what gene is responsible for that. So we'd still manage them as a high risk where the genetic test, if it came back negative, they'd say, oh, I don't have that. I don't have to worry about that. Well, yeah, you would because you still have that family history. That's why we need to talk to our family members whenever the opportunity arises Mm -hmm. so that we really do know. Because seriously, Mm -hmm. in my family, I know we don't talk about that stuff. It just doesn't come up. But when it becomes important to your overall health for everybody involved, it's just a smart thing to do. And that's one thing that we're really working to is one of the stethoscopes of the future, we really do believe, is that patients can own their own genetic information. But one of the tools that is very important is actually having the pathology, the reports from their doctors. You know, some people will say, oh, I had liver cancer. I have physicians in my family and they still say my grandmother died of liver cancer. Well, no, she had colon cancer that went to the liver. So it's just one of those things that getting the right information is very, very important. So if family members are willing to share their records, we really are trying to develop ways that those family members can get that information, not only that, upload and keep in their record their family's results, because that will change what we do with them. Because the family history we know to be watching, even if the testing doesn't show us that they're is a tendency or an occurrence of it at this Mm -hmm. point in time. Just the fact that it runs in your family gives us a good reason to watch extra carefully. Right. Right. I think there's a big piece of misinformation out there that genetic testing can tell us everything. Mm -hmm. So if I have a negative genetic test, that means I'm good. And that's not really what it means. There's always context that we have to back up and put that genetic test within that box. Well, it says your risk is decreased if you're negative. It doesn't mean that your risk is zero. Were you tested for this condition? Well, you weren't even tested for that condition. So this didn't give you any kind of a risk assessment. So there's definitely a piece of misinformation out there that genetic testing can tell us everything. And maybe one day, but probably not. There's always going to be more that's up to chance, that's environmental, it's lifestyle. And then there's the genetic component. So it's genetic healthcare. That's our topic today on Talking Solutions. So Dr. Rob Rowley, once again, talking information and balance about this, that genetic healthcare is very much a benefit for all of us. But as your patient, someone could come into you and say, I'm curious, I think I'd like to have some of this testing. Do you agree? At that point, you get the testing. And then getting the test back, we end up in a meeting, possibly a consultation with both you and with Anna Victorine, talking about the results of those tests tests and yeah. where we go from here. You just brought up a really good point to emphasize too, is there's two parts of that. There's meeting before the testing and then there's meeting after the testing. And that meeting before the testing really is when you make that decision that you understand what you're making in the decision. Because if you've never been through that process, going through it myself, once you see that on paper, it's really an emotional thing that you go through of seeing that's you and that's your risk and knowing, geez, now I have to make a decision with it before you can kind of walk around blindly thinking I'm not at risk or I'm at risk. Information is such a big deal. I just got some results on an ultrasound last week. Nothing was found. The only reason why I bring this up because I find it really interesting. On the report, it said it was unremarkable, which I thought was great. (laughs) (laughs) I never knew that I love that phrase You don't want a remarkable one. (laughs) No, it was unremarkable. You don't want to be exceptional. (laughs) I am so proud to be unremarkable. Yeah. Genetic health care. It's here and it's a benefit that many of us can actually pursue. And we've got Dr. Rob Rowley and also Anna Victor board-certified genetic counselor with Providence Healthcare. Anything I forgot? I think the only other thing I would bring up, one of the things that families, if they're not ready for this, and let's say they have a loved one that's terminally ill, one of the things we talk about is DNA banking. We don't do that, but Marshfield Clinic up in Wisconsin does it. But what you can do is actually draw their blood and send it off and store it for a very reasonable fee, and they'll save, I think, 15 years. So if something does come up in your family or that family member doesn't really feel comfortable with that, that's something you can do, and we do help facilitate 
facilitate that process to get people to store their DNA for future decisions. That's something that a lot of patients don't even know is an option. And I, I hadn't heard of that before. Yeah, I bring it up in a lot of my sessions for the patients that say, I'm really not sure that I want this information, but I would love to be able to help my kids one day, for instance. I say, well, why don't we talk a little bit more about DNA banking? You can just provide us with a blood sample. We can draw it here. We'll send it over to Wisconsin or to other companies that can DNA bank it. And then it's always there. So if you pass away, then it's there and your daughter or your son can have it tested later to try and get more information for themselves. Wow. So it's a great option that's out there and very few people know that it's an option that's out there. Just a lot of technology to medicine these days. Yeah. It is Genetic Healthcare. Dr. Rob Rowley with us. Also Anna Victorine, board certified genetic counselor with Providence Healthcare. Thank you so much for coming in to join us today on Talking Solutions. Thanks well, for thank having us. Thank you so us. much for having us. Talking Solutions is a production of the Community Relations Department here at Beasley Media Group Las Vegas. Get more information on today's topic on our Talking Solutions page on Facebook, where you will also find links and a podcast of today's show. Thanks for listening and have a great week.